Here we are with Global Connections. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think Tech. Um, today, we're going to spring off an article that was in Foreign Affairs. Uh, it was called Mexico's Dying Democracy. No better person to discuss this uh, than Carlos Suarez, our old friend here on Think Tech uh, at the East West Center. Carlos, welcome to the show. Aloha, Jay. Always a pleasure to connect. And of course, uh, as you said, a, a chance to talk and reflect and, and understand a little bit of what's going on with our very important neighbor to the south, you know, Mexico, this country that is, you know, so important to us. It's, uh, of course, our closest and our very valued partner for the U.S., 2,000 mile border, et cetera, et cetera. But it's off the radar often. You know, we have so much happening in the world, of course, with, you know, uh, Russia's invasion in Ukraine, endless other stuff, whether it's Middle East or Asia or Indo-Pacific, whatever. Mexico, uh, it's a country that is going through a lot of change at the moment. And we want to talk about, you've mentioned there's a new article that just came out in Foreign Affairs magazine, a very influential journal. And uh, Denise Dresser, the author, is a, a Mexican political scientist. She's a public intellectual. And in this article, Mexico's Dying Democracy, she really sheds light on, on a pretty worrisome trend, uh, this growing authoritarian populism, the variation in Mexico. And it, it matters because, again, Mexico is not necessarily a faraway place. It is our important neighbor to the south and uh, second largest trading partner. Uh, but uh, interesting dynamics because it also reflects global trends. We see rather than you know, the polarization. Well, and trends in the United States. Yeah. Of course. You know, I was telling you, if you change a few of the nouns, you could be confused that this article actually is talking about the U.S. of A. Um, these trends are very, very concerning. Uh, they're concerning in Mexico, but they're also concerning as a statement of what might happen or what is happening here in the United States. Sure. Um, so we should see what's going on in Mexico, because in a funny way, this article tells you that Mexico is a leader on the way into autocracy. Yes, and and you know, let me put some context to that. Of course, Mexico has a like many of Latin America's countries have a tradition of authoritarian rule. That is, democracy is a relatively new thing for Mexico. About thirty years, you know, really the the late nineteen eighties began to see the erosion of what until then had been a very stable and strong authoritarian system. It was a one party rule, a political party that was formed. Mexico. Uh, like Russia, they had a revolution in the early 20th century, and, and it led to, by the 1920s, the establishment of a new political system, one party that dominated everything. And, and it was, you know, what we call a form of corporatism or, or clientelism, where every sector of society was weaved into this political party. Uh, it's often described as the perfect dictatorship because it looked like a democracy. Every six years, you would have an election. There's a political party. That same party would even fund a few small parties to make it look like it was plural. But everybody knew in the end, you know, 85, 95 percent of the vote went to that same party. Well, the system worked for many, many decades. It provided stability after years of violence and conflict. But at some point in time, it, it, it is not democratic to have one party that governs. Right. And so by the 1980s, you began to see pressures coming at the state and local level. Uh, and by the election of 1988, Mexico has a six year term for president. In 1988, it came to really be a, a, a challenge to the system where a new candidate said, wait a minute, I would like to be president. Let's have a, you know, a, a debate, a process. That election took place. It was likely to be fraudulent. It elected Carlos Salinas, who would become, of course, the architect of NAFTA uh, in the early 90s. Um, the election uh, would also mark kind of like the end of that, that long uh, standing authoritarian rule. So fast forward quickly, I'm moving too fast here, but in the year 2000 was a political earthquake for Mexico. They had a presidential election that ended 70 years of one party rule. An opposition candidate wins. Uh, this opposition party, the PAN, sort of a right of center business party, becomes you know the next uh, leader. Fast forward three more presidencies, and suddenly in the year 2018, uh, Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador. His name is Andres Manuel. His surname is Lopez Obrador, but we know him as AMLO. He becomes president of Mexico. He had actually tried twice before and probably lost fraudulently in 2006. Lost again in 2012. But in 2018, he wins with a very broad popular mandate, essentially a rejection of the, you know, very corrupt and, and, and the predecessor of him was a pretty ineffective president. Let's so let me get this straight, yes. Carlos. So the period of enlightenment was at the end of that 70 year, 70 year period, which was around 2000 or so. Yeah. Um, and, and um, you know, so it starts at 2000 and 2018, we have AMLO. And all of a sudden, between 2018 and now, um, the thing has moved 
dramatically um, to uh, authoritarian rule and various things, which we we will discuss here now on the show. But uh, what's what's interesting about it, if not frightening, is that you can have a democratic arrangement, uh, an enlightened arrangement, even, and then all of a sudden, in the space of four years, you can lose it. Yeah. Isn't that what happened? Well, it is, and it shows you that democracy is fragile and, and and things like norms that we take for granted in some cultures and some political systems it takes years to develop you know in the united states hundreds of years of developing eventually even something like the the norm of a peaceful transfer of power that was just taken for granted you lose the election you give it up you move on well this past election for the u.s suddenly that got called into question and and has eroded uh, and today we still have large populations who believe the election you know was a fraud let's move quickly to mexico and say well clearly mexico under you know a changing society you know growing middle class uh you know more connection to the global economy uh but also persistent poverty massive inequality it's a very unequal society by any measure uh people are frustrated they want change now interestingly this political party the pri that i mentioned that ruled for 70 years they were a very nationalistic party. They were, you know, broad based and they provided, again, a sort of a safety net for all of society. Now, over time, it eroded. It's, you know, it's not democratic, but you did have by the year 2000 and since then, the development of new, more autonomous institutions like an electoral, uh, uh, basically a uh, institute for the electoral system. Because before that, Mexico, basically the party in power would count the ballots, much like in Russia. They have an election and basically the the party in power counts the ballots. That's not a democracy. You need a autonomous, independent electoral system. But that same system now has been eroded, and 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 the current president of Mexico has basically stripped it, its power. Tried to install, you know, what we're seeing is the the authoritarian playbook, and we see it played out in many other countries of the world, uh, whether it's in Hungary, Nicaragua, uh, Poland, Turkey, Venezuela, even the United States. You know, basically, you know, eroding again the institutions that are meant to be part of our democratic system. Uh, another key part that's been very interesting for Mexico is the militarization. The role of the military has taken on a dramatic change. Uh, and again, too, you know, we don't have time to cover it here, but traditionally Mexico had a military that was kind of removed from politics. Uh, and in, in, very different from other parts of Central and South America where the military, you may have a memory of military coups, military governments throughout Latin America. Uh, in the 1960s and 70s, we had waves of them, not Mexico. Again, it was depoliticized. That all changed. By the 1990s, the drug war, you know, now popularized by the narco series on Netflix, this changed in Mexico. And the president at the time, uh, Felipe Calderon, used the military to take on the drug cartels. And that changed everything. Suddenly today, we have a military and that has now been more, given more power, but is increasingly corrupt and, and has been penetrated by these powerful criminal drug cartels. Uh, but the president is essentially in a very curious way now using the military uh, for things that, you know, traditionally had not been. Uh, and uh, it's a bit worrisome. Uh, today, the military is operating a lot of areas outside of uh, uh, or things that traditionally have been done by others. It's building uh, airports. It's running the ports, controlling the customs, uh, distributing money to the poor, uh, implementing social programs and even detaining immigrants. Again, these are functions that traditionally are done by, you know, civilian institutions. But it's also done some terrible things, some sinister things, either in the open or, in, you know, behind the screen. Uh, can you talk about the uh, the 41 students who disappeared? Yeah, 43, actually. Yeah, in the year 2014, it's been now eight years. In September, there was a dramatic uh, violence, basically a, a group of uh, students, uh, young students uh, that had been gathering, uh, I believe it was the state of Guerrero, if I'm not mistaken, yeah, south of Mexico City, suddenly uh, disappear. And it's just typical in Mexico, the investigations just go awry and nobody knows anything. And, and years go by, they never find anybody. Well, this is eight years now. And finally, under this president, they have begun to uncover a little more, but it's clear that the military itself, the local political officials, everybody was involved. And the bodies essentially disappeared. And in gruesome ways, probably through, you know, again, it sounds like a theater, but, you know, dis burning them, disappearing them with acid, who knows. But again, that became a rallying cry for many about really the just the total lack of accountability, the impunity, the violence. Uh, and, uh, you know, it, even to this day, it, it's still unresolved. Uh, you know, again, 43 students disappeared. You know, uh, Carlos, she talks about the decline of, of civil rights 
um, the decline of the rule of law. Geez, this is very troublesome given what we are seeing in this country as a, as a step along the way. How people um, are arrested for trumped up charges and thrown in jail, including political adversaries. Um, so under AMLO, um, this has taken on a very, a very nefarious, um, a sinister kind of uh, image that you can be an ordinary person, but if you're on the wrong side of the tracks, you go to jail. Yeah, it is. It's troublesome. And, and it speaks to, on some level, uh, the personalistic style of governing that he has as, as a particular authoritarian leader. Uh, his rhetoric and his policy decisions have really put a lot of democratic norms and institutions at risk. It's very interesting, even to this day, four years into his presidency, literally every morning he starts with a press conference that can go on for one to two hours, sometimes more, on and on. And, you know, it's open and transparent, but it's also, you know, at some point, he uses these often to just simply criticize everybody and anybody that criticizes him. Uh, and uh, he denies the legitimacy of any opponents, uh, you know, calling them traitors to the country, again, using language that is really again, eroding the civil discourse. Uh, and, uh, you know, if a journalist is there questioning him, it, 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 it becomes kind of like what we saw happen even under Trump with press conferences where it, it just turns into a little shouting match and, uh, and very, uh, yeah, just very uncivil, you could say. And Dresser talks about it as theater. Yes, uh, one, it is. One of the techniques theater. of achieving autocracy is creating daily theater. Exactly. Yeah, I know. And it is. And, and of course, Mexico has a long tradition of, you know, sort of, aspects of, you know, I think it was uh, Gabriel Garcia Marquez from Colombia who called it magical realism. But it's this, you know, often living, you know, with myths and, and, and you know, pushing again. Uh, and part of it is stems from even just, again, the plight of many people in Mexico is a pretty tough environment, you know, the, the social injustice, the poverty, and how you deal with that often, you just have to make, you know, I don't know, uh, like you said, even like a form of political theater. Uh, but it is, you know, she calls it pedestal politics, I think. Uh, it's a daily act of political theory, she refers to, a, a performative presidency where he spins a tale of heroic fight against the privileged elites, and those are one of his biggest, you know, anybody who is the mafia of power, he calls them, uh, uh, perverted feminists and corrupt experts. Uh, and so uh, it, everyone is conspiring against the public, and he, again, you hear this again and again, he alone can represent the will of the pure, true people. Uh, his rhetoric is very simple. Uh, he sees a very seismic shift and it's not a mere course correction. And, you know, just to put this into context, when he came to power uh, four years ago now, he has used the term the fourth transformation for Mexico. He sees his view. He's got a vision of, of really kind of like a, one of these watershed moments. Uh, Mexico won its independence from Spain in the 1810 uh, period, early 19th century. That was the first. It had a liberal movement under President Benito Juarez, my namesake, uh, at the late 19th century, uh, Lincoln, Abraham Lincoln's pen pal. And then the revolution of 1910. These are cataclysmic events. Well, he sees his presidency as the fourth transformation, getting rid of the old. But again, the curious thing is what we see is a lot more of the old coming back. Uh, even the economic policies giving primacy to the oil company, which is you know, sort of the most uh, ineffective and indebted oil company in the world. Uh, he's investing heavily in, in a new oil refinery built by the military. Uh, and then using, again, sort of the democratic norms, just to give you an example, one of the things he's done quite effectively is using referendums. Uh, and it almost sounds like a playbook out of, you know, let's go into the eastern Donbass region of Ukraine and see what the people want. He's done that for several uh, initiatives in Mexico. Let's have a referendum where my political party chooses, you know, the participants and, uh, you know, sets up the ballot and counts it all. And, 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 and there's fraud in there, too. It's a joke. It doesn't represent sort of like an actual, you know, again, you don't have an independent uh, authority that's counting the ballots. Uh, and so you get the results you want. And but it erodes trust and, and it creates distrust. And uh, yeah, so it's, it's a it's a well, Was he the one who used the phrase, let's make Mexico great again? Well, I wouldn't say he used it directly, but many have attributed it to him. Make, make Mexico great again. And in that in his case, he would fight against the deeply ingrained corruption and eradicate persistent poverty. Now, interestingly, in the name of that agenda, he has removed checks and balances, weakened autonomous institutions, and he has seized discretionary control of the budget in ways that are just, you know, any authoritarian would be quite pleased, you know, in terms of what he's done. Uh, again, I would go back, probably one of his biggest legacies is going to be this issue of uh, 
uh, of basically militarizing uh, uh, the, the, the country in a dramatic way. Uh, and this is a real about face. He came to office. He had a campaign slogan that was, uh, what was it called? Abrazos, no balazos. Hugs, not bullets. You know, we're just going to all hug and get along. Well, he has given the military a lot of new bullets and power and, and control, again, over many areas. Uh, and, uh, you know, that same military is increasingly tainted with some corruption scandals. There was even a bizarre incident. I don't know if you remember this. A couple of years ago, the U.S. government arrested the former defense minister of Mexico. Oh, sure, in New York. Uh, uh, and got him. And, re and then within a couple of days, he was handed back over kind of just silently like, well, OK. And. You know, and then he was released. He was released in Mexico, and it was all like a technical this and that. And yet they had pretty detailed uh, you know, evidence that this guy was in the pocket, like some previous high-ranking officials of the cartels. So it was a weird thing because, again, Mexico suddenly got him back, and then they released him. Even to this day, the U.S. government is like, what? You know, we, we went out of our way to, you know, uh, and then and so it was a little bizarre incident. But really, back to the main point, it's, it's just this this process of, uh, again, uh, instead of reigning in the army, uh, he has unleashed it uh, and given it roles that, again, traditionally uh, are not meant for the military. Even today, uh, there's a new airline that is being proposed. Get this. Uh, and he's getting the Cubans, because Cuba has a, 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 a national airline as well, to sort of have the military now run this new airline. Uh, it's interesting. Uh, so this, this it, it's a playbook, again, right out of the Cuban, uh, and, and literally getting Cuban advisors to help do that. So it's... it's well, can, you know, can you achieve a better economy using the military and corruption, as you have described? Or at the end of the day, um, does the economy take a hit on this? Uh, has he done anything of value uh, for Mexico? Well, you know, the, the key point is that you've seen really a, a reluctance of some foreign investment to come back in. And it's mostly to do with his energy policy. He's had a very mixed bag of really uh, some policies and more specifically that it's going to be challenged under the you know NAFTA agreement because he is giving he's changed the rules to give like more uh, favoritism to Mexico's national electricity company um and again violating some of the terms of the free trade agreement so it's it's becoming uh you know rather than uh well no it's becoming a tense issue right now and it's playing out in some dispute settlement mechanisms that the us mca the the you know nafta renegotiated nafta agreement it was signed in 2020 the united states mexico canada agreement as it's called and it has these new mechanisms for resolving some disputes uh, and so, yeah, it's playing out in that way. But uh, again, I would just say uh, the overall sense is that his policies have kind of harkened back to the 1970s, you know, giving primacy to, again, uh, oil production when Mexico could and should be a leader in a lot of alternative and, and even, you know, uh, solar energy. Uh, um, but uh, he is kind of giving primacy maybe to the traditional, uh, more state-led uh, investment. So it's a mixed bag. Carlos, can you talk about uh, the relationship of Mexico with the United States uh, under under AMLO? Yeah, that's an interesting point, because uh, we recall that when Trump came into office, he, uh, of course, had some very strong anti-immigrant sentiment and, and statements that you know angered many. But in a curious way, uh, AMLO uh, and, and, and uh, Trump had a pretty good, friendly relationship. Uh, they met a couple of times. Uh, and even though, of course, Trump bullied and, you know, strong armed AMLO into having to take on a more aggressive stand against the, remember those caravans of migrants sealing the southern border. Well, yeah. Biden comes into office and it's a more complex relationship. They're engaging Mexico more on many issues, human rights, you know, environmental issues. Uh, and in a way, it's more annoying for the Mexican president, because with Trump, at least as long as, you know, he didn't do anything, you know, Trump would you know go away. But now there's more engagement. John Kerry, of course, has ha already had several visits to Mexico, trying to sort of, you know, address, uh, you know, some common areas of interest. But it has been frustrating and difficult. Uh, but maybe, uh, again, the bottom line is that I think with, with U.S. Uh, relations, uh, it's so delicate and there's so many levels and layers going on that part of me wants to say there's a lot of continuity. And, and today the relations are so complex that Again, at the state and local level, you have deep interdependence uh, between and, and in the business community. But I want to separate that from the presidential relations, which, which are important, but they're different. And so today, I would say that the relations are somewhat tense between Biden and, and AMLO, indeed. Uh, and even Kamala Harris, who's had several visits to Mexico, you know, she 
addressing the Central American migrant issue. Uh, but let me just add to that, that AMLO is a president of Mexico. We've had many recent presidents who are kind of globally oriented, you know, speak English or are more engaged with the international community, not AMLO. He does not speak English. He doesn't travel abroad. He's literally had maybe two trips since his presidency and not interested in global issues. So he's, he's not, you know, he's not too interested in diplomacy, you could say. Um, but he's now four years into his presidency. He has two more years. So this is an interesting time where now he's looking at, you know, the tail end. What is the legacy going to be? And uh, Mexico, again, six year, no re-election. So they're about to have an election in two years. That's right now the agenda is looking at that. Who's going to follow? And I would say this, that in the past, Mexico had a one party, this PRA. They had a party that had a set of values and, you know, let's say what it stood for. Today, it's less about the party and it's more the personal rule of this AMLO. It's a personalistic authoritarian rule, a cult of personality. And that's problematic because the day he leaves, well, what follows is it's, you know, it's going to be someone else. Well, can he run again? Will he run again? Uh, no, no. He, there is no real again, even if he can't run again. It, it would require a constitutional change that is not in the cards. Even though he does have a majority, it would be a super majority needed. And just, I don't see that in the cards now. So instead, he's going to try to help someone who's going to, you know, continue his legacy. Uh, there are two likely or expected candidates to follow him. His current foreign minister, Marcelo Ebrard, you know, a very worldly, you know, internationalist type of guy. Uh, and the current mayor of Mexico City, a woman. Um, and uh, she's, uh, they're both from his party. Uh, and they are sort of the expected uh, candidates to succeed him. Both of them, I would say, are a bit more competent than him. They're, you know, pr pretty well educated and, and worldly. I mean, uh, if you consider expertise any value. Um, and so it'll be interesting to see how that transition plays out because Amlo is such a prominent sort of figure and cult of personality that it's hard to imagine him just passing on the reins, you know? Yeah, and, yeah. Well, you know, one thing, one thing comes to mind is, you know, I've, I've, I've come to feel that the, the road to autocracy is a one-way street. In other words, when you move in that direction, um, hard to, it's hard to turn it around. Um, you, you, you imply, though, that uh, there could be someone else who comes in as the next president of Mexico, however selected, and could be more enlightened. Um, is it possible that the, you know, the road to autocracy that uh, AMLO has, 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 has created, has, has advanced on, could be reversed in Mexico? Yeah, I mean, I, I want to think so, and I, I want to hope so, because right now it has been eroding, it has been backsliding. Uh, I mentioned the two right now, the top likely candidates, uh, uh, Marcelo Ebrard. Interestingly, he's a son of, or uh, he's an, I want to say grandson of French immigrants who came to, uh, to Mexico in the late 19th century, a, a large diaspora from uh, you know, sort of in the textile industry. So he's got this kind of French uh, heritage. The other is Claudia Scheinbaum. She's the mayor of Mexico City, a very competent uh, Earth, you know, sort of a climate scientist. I think she was part of the panel that won the UN uh, uh, Climate Science Peace uh, 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 Nobel Prize, whatever. But the point is that she's the mayor of Mexico City, quite popular and, and a very competent, uh, you know, scientist. Uh, and she's got a very, you know, German last name, uh, very much, again, part of the Mexican elite. And so I kind of mentioned that because in Mexico, of course, uh, this current president, he's kind of very populist, you know, man of the people and, you know, goes and he hugs all the poor. He's very popular with the poor. These other two, they're more from the traditional elite uh, and they don't have that same degree of either, I want to say, uh, authoritarian tendency, but maybe not even that, more the the populist charm. Uh, they're competent leaders in their own right. and so. Uh, Part of me thinks that, yeah, maybe they can bring back, and they are both, you know, progressive leaders, left of center, which I think Mexico needs. The country really has a very deeply unequal society. Uh, but AMLO, even though he is a leftist, uh, unfortunately, he's a leftist of the sort of the authoritarian populist demagogue variation. And, and in the end, it kind of comes full circle. He ends up being a bedfellow with Donald Trump uh, over time. Uh, and we look and compare, we haven't talked a lot about, you know, other authoritarian, you know, uh, leaders that we've seen throughout the world, whether it's in Turkey, Venezuela, you know, in Philippines. I would add to this, the role of the military. I mentioned it a few times, and this is something that is different from Mexico. Uh, and yet in many authoritarian regimes, maybe it's in Indonesia, South Korea, even Philippines, the military as an institution has often been a very powerful political actor. Traditionally, not in Mexico, but that is changed. And today, that military, more powerful, more resources, is not 
as easy to send back to the barracks. So that's the worrisome trend. So what does this mean to the rest of Latin America? You know, Mexico in its own way is, has been a leader. It's, it's big. It's close to the U.S. It has more ties with the U.S. than any other Latin American country has. Um, it's had you know, a tradition, at least for a time, uh, of being a democracy and successful. Um, but, but now with this, and the description that Dresser makes in the article is really chilling. He goes through every possible implication of what AMLO is doing and how all these institutions are changing uh, under, under their feet. Uh, this is nothing exempt from the, the changes that, that are happening under him, and it's pretty scary. Yeah. So the question is, how does that affect other countries, including yeah. other autocracies or would-be autocracies um, south of the Mexican border? Yeah, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a good question. Um, not a quick answer. I would just say because we have this idea that Latin America, as if it's this, you know, single monogamy, of course, there's a lot of variation. And you have some countries pretty well institutionalized, you know, vibrant or more vibrant democracies. And I'm thinking here maybe places like Chile to some extent, uh, 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 even arguably Uruguay and Argentina. Um, I guess it's, I'm going to say this, that, uh, you know, today Latin America has enough variations of authoritarian rule that we can't just speak of it as left or right. It, you know, you have several that are on the left, but different types, some that are more, I would say, maybe traditional left of center, sort of social Democrat type. Uh, and we see a few of those today, the new leader in, in Peru. Uh, no, 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 not Peru, sorry, in, in, in uh, Colombia, the new leader in, in, in Chile, who's a young guy that's had a bumpy start. But, uh, you know, I say that because I don't see these as the extreme authoritarian type. Mexico's AMLO is a curious variation because it, it's almost like he's more in common with Bolsonaro, although he's from the right in Brazil. Uh, and yet others here, another quick thought, and I'm thinking out loud is that, you know, Mexico, of course, is a, is a big brother. It's the largest Spanish speaking country like Brazil. It's a major power. But I want to say that curiously, I think other countries are looking increasingly less to it as either the model or the, or I don't know, or the, the one to follow. And what I mean by that is that increasingly they're just looking at their own region and their own, you know, systems and and, and less Mexico, because Mexico is in many ways been a unique, a sui generis, generous as genesis. I'm sorry, it it didn't follow the same patterns of other countries where, again, the role of the military, the military coups that were so common in South America, not Mexico. Mexico developed this unique one party system that uh, others probably wish maybe the closest would be the Communist Party in, in Cuba, uh, where you know, a long party rule. But that system broke in the year 2000. So we now we've had this kind of country in transition becoming democratic, which is healthy, just like other parts of Latin America. But let me see a final takeaway would be just the trend we see everywhere in the US and in South and Central America is polarization of politics increasingly. Yeah. Uh, to the left, to the right, and you don't have a, a very effective sort of middle range, moderate political party system. And unfortunately, Latin America does not have a long history of sort of party politics, democratic politics. So all these democracies are relatively fragile, and we see mm -hmm. the erosion. Uh, and Mexico is a, one more example. Really, it's really too bad because uh, Mexico could be, um, this is a geographical concept, but it could be the capstone of all of Latin America. It could be a leader. It could bring the, all the Latin American countries together. I mean, geographically, theoretically, but it isn't doing that. And, and I suggest to you that what AMLO is doing to Mexico is taking it further from a position of leadership of Latin America. Do you agree? I agree. And I think uh, the key point you meant, meant or the key takeaway here is that he has not been a very regional or global leader. In other words, he has not taken the leadership mantle of Latin America. He could. He could have been, hey, you know, I, you know. And in a curious way, that lack of his interest, his lack of any global or even regional interest has left him less effective as a leader. Uh, because Mexico, just by virtue of its size and population, its popular culture, it's a powerful country for Latin America. Uh, it has a lot of influence through its soft power uh, and its sheer size and you know its economy and whatnot. But I, it's not taking a, it's not leading. It, it's sort of just, you know, looking inward at the moment and uh, meanwhile the other countries are kind of going on their own or or maybe looking elsewhere i think that would be a way of putting it you know the one thing we uh, we we haven't talked about which we should talk about uh, is the effect of the uh, women's protests women's groups uh, the political effect of those groups and and uh, civil society organizations in general under amlo's uh, government can you talk about that yeah 
Absolutely. And I think uh, actually this article we've made reference to, Denise, it speaks a lot to that, really the erosion of civil society groups. And this is, again, this is democracy. This is suddenly people, you know, voicing their concerns, calling attention. And Mexico has a terrible, terrible problem of violence and violence against women. Uh, basically, uh, you made a reference earlier, what we have an average of 11 women are killed every day. Uh, and, you know, it, it, it really is, uh, um, I guess, worrisome because as, as Dresser points out, uh, interestingly today, one of the most sort of uh, thorns in the side of AMLO are feminist organizations that have really been disappointed by his lack of either addressing, you know, human rights issues, uh, you know, and even I think uh, the article makes a, a comment how now when they have protests in the big center plaza, the government has to put up these steel barriers in front of the National Palace that never existed before. So the, you know, the protests have gotten more violent and uh, I think um, I made a reference to this actually about a month ago, this particular author, she's a public intellectual, well-known activist, she was protesting in the central square of the Socalo and literally got uh, harassed and, and, and chased out by a group of thugs that were supporters of the president, calling her a traitor, a uh, uh, they called her a burguesa, like a bourgeoisie and blah, blah, blah. So it's just a very ugly environment. I mean, you know, if, if you if you... Well, uh, and, and, and it has eroded, again, the, the trust of, of what are the role of civil society groups, because in democracies, that's, you know, that's where you have uh, voices coming out. And uh, when you suppress that, uh, it's not a good sign for, again, democratic uh, system. Well, in the context of a, sort of a First Amendment approach, um, freedom of speech, uh, which seems to be under attack in Mexico, which is under attack in Mexico, it's also associated with uh, freedom of religion. Uh, Mexico is a Catholic country for the most part. Uh, query, uh, how does AMLO do with the Catholic Church? Yeah, well, and this is curious because it's not spoken a lot about it, but interestingly, he is often referred to as an evangelical Christian. Uh, in other words, he's got a, a part of him, and, and yet it's not openly, and people don't always understand it in the same way we, we often do in the U.S., sort of the Protestant evangelical. But I would say this, evangelicals have had a tremendous growth in Mexico as in other parts of Latin America. But the Catholic Church, you know, interestingly, in different times in Mexico, it was a very much a bastion of conservatism and, and you know, very, you know, uh, and, and at times linked closely to the government for stability purposes. Today, the role of the Catholic Church is not, you know, it's not what it had been before. And, and I would say he's not particularly, it's not a particularly big angle of it. Uh, Mexico is liberalizing and, and moving, you know, to liberalize abortion and, and things like that. But going back to the, 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 the feminists that you spoke about a moment ago, it is interestingly because he doesn't seem to understand and cannot control and has not been able to suppress this. Uh, and so you have a situation where today women in, in Mexico are angry and rightfully so, uh, given the tide of femicide that is sweeping. Uh, they have a lot of frustration that the government's response to many murders and, and, and it has intensified. He seems to be impervious and disdainful uh, of their demands. So mm. it's a it's a messy situation. And today, Mexican feminists are more energized and more combative than ever. Uh, and uh, they're trying to reframe the public debate in favor of their rights and against this militarization. And let me add that one more thing. Uh, again, the militarization, I haven't mentioned it. I'll finish with this, though. But uh, under the new AMLO, he created a brand new National Guard. And interestingly, it was modeled after the Italian Carabinieri. It's kind of like a police force that's national because, of course, the police are very corrupt in Mexico, as you could expect. But this new National Guard was meant to be kind of like a civilian controlled force that is gone away. And today, this new National Guard has been placed under the Defense Ministry, and any pretense of it being a civilian agency is gone. And so this is one of the concerns, again, that, that, that you don't have effectively institutions that can address law enforcement, because military is very different from law enforcement. And law enforcement, you know, right, um, it requires investigation, rules, laws, that's not happening. Instead, you mm -hmm. have a militarization, and, you know, that's Shade, Shades of Mussolini. That's what it evokes for me. You sure. know, one thing about this article, I, mean, I think you had the same reaction that I did about it, is that um, there's a lot of revelations in here, things that you might you might not have been aware of uh, that have either happened recently or have happened in, in, in below the radar. You lived in Mexico until a couple of years ago, yeah, or yeah. Qu qu quite a few quite years. Quite some time, and so, yes. And I'll, I'll bet you there were things in this article that you, you know, didn't see living on the ground. Mm -hmm. And so it, it, what it uh, suggests is a kind of a vacuum in the global press on what is going on in Mexico. We yeah. see it in foreign affairs, but we don't see it in the Times or the Post. 
Uh, we don't see it on Reuters. Um, what's going on? And and why why is there this vacuum? And will the vacuum be filled? And will you and I have another show about this? You know, you've touched on so many important points there. And, and you know, I spent, as you mentioned, I, I came back from whole Mexico about a year and a half ago. I was there off and on about four or five years. And one of my frustrations the whole time there was, how can I find good information, accurate information, you know, information that's not just completely... And I never could. I kept looking and asking. I mean, there were a few minor sources uh, of, you know, good quality journalism, but very difficult. And even today, back outside of Mexico, I'm hard pressed to find stuff about Mexico. Exactly. You can look at the Washington Times, and there's rarely anything. Or if there is, it's a little violent story here or there. You don't have a lot of coverage over this very important country. <laughs> now, Foreign Affairs is an influential magazine. It's written by, I mean, it's it's read by, you know, intellectuals, foreign policy geeks. But it is influential, and uh, and and you know Denise Dresser. I said at the outset, she's well known in the international community. She's known in Mexico today more because she is a thorn in Amlo's side. She has been a tremendous critic, and he has singled her out in some of his morning press conferences as you know part of the you know corrupt uh, you know neoliberal mafia this or that. Uh, at the end of the day, she is putting the you know the torch under him and and you know holding him accountable in a very dramatic way. So uh, it's interesting to see it play out, uh, but it is worrisome, again, very worrisome, because I saw this actually in the last days I was in Mexico, he began to take on the academic community, and Mexico had long established this council sort of for science and technology, maybe the equivalent of our National Science Foundation, National Endowment for the Humanities, gives out grant money, you know, brings together the expert academic community, well, he has completely trashed that and, and eroded, again, any pretense of, uh, of Again, you know, science experts and so on. So, for you know, for those in the expert community, it, it's 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 tragic. It's it's pretty sad yeah, yeah. because again, Mexico, as difficult as it is to do what it does, suddenly it's just this is two or three steps back, and and that's going to take time to recover. Uh, the tragedy, as 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 all moves to autocracy are in the twenty first century. Thank you so much, Carlos. Uh, Carlos Juarez of the East West Center. Aloha, and I hope to see you again soon. Aloha, Jay. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.